Well, I'm going to make an attempt here uh, to put a cap on this series that we've been in, in uh, Psalm 23. Uh, I went back, it's, it's been a, a nine-week journey for six verses of Scripture. And uh, it probably could have been more, but this last, this last verse just kind of took on a whole life of its own, and uh, it's been powerful. Um, the last verse, verse 6, is just kind of that ending point that David's putting an exclamation point on everything that's been previously said. He says, surely your goodness and love, they're going to follow me, okay? And we know that it's going to pursue my heart. It's going to come after me for all the days of my life. As long as I have breath, as long as I have the ability to breathe and live and move and all of this in this world and beyond, you're going to be with me, Lord. And then the last stanza says this, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So that's where we're going to end up. But I wanted to highlight what we have grown to understand through the examination of this scripture. And we've gone, man, in so many different directions. The Holy Spirit has given us some great revelations into, and insights as we looked at some of the Hebrew words and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to go into uh, all of the detail with that. You can go back and look at the uh, online versions. They're all there. But we have grown to understand. I think something that we have to all understand about David. David was not a god. Okay, I think sometimes we have a tendency to paint people in scriptures as these, you know, superhuman, you know, type people. They were men and women just like you and me that had flaws. They had stuff. They had some junk in their trunk. Okay, and the truth is, is that God used them. Okay, in in miraculous ways. David was a man, just like us. You can read about the struggles. You can read about the obstacles and even the temptations that he faced in his life. He understood the evils of life, he, yet he had a determination to serve God. I don't understand always why God chooses to use us or me or anybody because I don't know about you, but sometimes I look in the mirror and I don't like what I see. It's sometimes hard to do a self-examination because you know the thoughts, you know the intents of the heart, you know, but God is the one that judges the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And he's the one that embraces me despite that. When you read through Hebrews 11, you can see great men and women of faith. And one of the things that you do not see there, I mean, you see all kinds. You see Abraham, you know, right? You see a prostitute in there. You see people that were used by God, and they may not have been the ones that you and I would have handpicked, but God chose to use them to advance his kingdom. What you don't see in that scripture in Hebrews 11 is perfection. You see people who have humbled themselves in their circumstances and they've just yielded themselves to God and said, use me, Lord. One of the things that we have grown to understand is David, he had a source. And his source was Yahweh. Yahweh, the most sacred and holy name for God. Amen? Amen. It wasn't that he didn't have things in his life. But his source was not money. His source was nothing of this world. It wasn't even about relationships or the talents that he had because Lord knows he had some of those things, right? But he saw and knew who his source was. And his source was Yahweh, the one and only true God, not one of many as we have said. But we've grown to understand that this source that David had is the same source that you and I have available to us each and every day. Our lives, when we placed our faith and our trust and our hope in Jesus Christ, 
We understood that Jesus accepted us despite our flaws, but all we had to do was receive the precious gift of grace. Through bowing our knees, through a recognition of our hearts, to just saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. The work was finished. It wasn't culture's definition. It was God's ordained time. There was no more strict adherence to rules and perceptions of God as this angry God. God poured out the full wrath that was due for sin on Jesus as He hung on that cross. Because Jesus was the perfect one. Jesus was the sacrificial lamb who took away the sin of the world. Jesus then became our shepherd, right? And David depicts this. And one of the things that we learned about shepherds is they carry the sheep very close to their heart from Isaiah. And, and, and we've also learned that in Yahweh, we do not lack anything, do we? It doesn't mean that you and I are immune from the difficulties of this life because Lord knows we are going to have challenges and trials. We're going to deal sometimes with health issues because these bodies just wear out. But we understand that in the midst of our journey, Jehovah God, right? He is our healer. He's our banner. He's our righteousness. He's our provider in all of these circumstances. I simply have to yield. I simply have to trust. And even in the face of difficult circumstances, we've discovered that God led and He guided David all through it. And David made these declarations in this wonderful psalm. Even in the face of his enemies, those that wanted to inflict harm upon him, he understood that God would always bring him to a place to bring him nourishment. Now, as we looked at the second verse, you probably remember the picture that I put up there of my cat, Astrid. I guess I call it mine now, okay? But uh, Astrid, if you remember, I showed a picture of her just kind of sitting up on, I think it was Kelly's lap, and she had her, her, her paws just kind of tucked in, and sheep will do that. The sheep will tuck in, it's, it's, this, uh, it's called rabats, okay? That's the word. It's a resting position. It's a safe place where there's no fear, where they feel relaxed. It doesn't mean that there's nothing, but when they're secure and in that place, and when we are secure and in that place with our shepherd, amen, we can rest even when there's predators circling about because we are in the shepherd's hands, amen? Amen. True security, friends, let's face it, is not going to be based on financial markets. It's not going to be based on other worldly measurements or preferences. It's going to be based on the one that we serve and we hold dear in our hearts, Jesus. You know, I wish we didn't have to humble ourselves, right? (laughs) Isn't that difficult sometimes because pride is kind of our natural inclination? But humility, and I ask the question, why does that always have to be involved? Because the truth is, friends, since the garden, man has always wanted to be their own God. And the truth is, is what humility does is it takes you and I off the throne of our lives and it places Jesus on the throne of our lives, His rightful place. We understand in James chapter 4 and 6 that he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. We understand in Colossians 3 that it tells us to literally cloak ourselves or clothe ourselves with humility. It should be a way of life for us as Christians. And sometimes if we're honest, I think we could all say that we can be guilty of a lack of humility. Sometimes we can think that we've done it ourselves, but friends, let's never forget Jesus is the one that's done the work. Amen. 
Another thing that we've learned is that he brings us to places where I experience the purifying waters of God. And one of the powerful verses in verse 3, it said that he refreshes my soul. Now, if you remember in that verse, I kind of told you a funny story about when I went out to Colorado and we were going into the higher elevations and I couldn't breathe because of the lack of oxygen that was in that thinner air. And one of the things that we needed was to, I was gasping for air. I just had to, and what took place is we had to get oxygen, right? You got to get oxygen in those lungs. And one of the things that we read in that scripture is that he restores my soul. In other words, he helps me in my life catch my breath. He catches my breath. The truth is we can all become spiritually bankrupt, right? We can all become in a place where our own efforts, we try and try and try, but friend, it's not going to replenish the deepest needs of our soul. My efforts are always going to fall short. However, God will never fall short. Can we say that together? God will never fall short. He restores me and He restores you completely. Amen? Amen. God spoke to us of the importance of the quiet place, the Sabbath rest that is needed, the way that we were created for a Sabbath rest. God brings me course correction sometimes because I can get caught up in the hurriedness of this life and we can get off track. But it says in the scripture that he guides us into the right path. Well, well, Pastor Craig, I don't feel comfortable sometimes in the right path. Well, he won't leave you even in unfamiliar territory. Because sometimes when we change, right? Sometimes when we swallow our pride and we step into places where we're actually going to yield ourselves and be willing to change and do things his way instead of ours, it's kind of unfamiliar. It might feel awkward at first, but you need to rest assured that God will never leave you in that place. He will walk right through that with you. He guides us on the right paths. And really, it's for His name's sake. Amen? Amen. Remember, we are His ambassadors, so let's do what we endeavor to do as Christian people. I hope it's in your heart to be His light. I hope it's in your heart to represent Him well. You see, David made it clear that God has things in control, but we do play a part in yielding. He chooses to trust us and to use us to advance His glorious message of life and hope. I think that's an incredible responsibility that every one of us carries as Christians. We also know that David knew the dark places, didn't we? He knew the dark places. And as he put this psalm on paper, as he penned it, we see the recollection of moments in his life that he experienced the incredible heart ache of, of, of life in general. He experienced the betrayal. He experienced, but yet he pressed on because as we have said all along, he has a source. And he even talked about the valley, right? He talked about the shadow of death. He talked about the unscalable walls, the gorge, if you will, where it, you can't see anything. And he talked about those places where there were no off-ramps, there was no turning around, where he was vulnerable on every side, But yet he knew something. He knew that in those times, God was greater. God's strength would be provided for him. Now I will tell you, that's the essence of 1 John 4 and 4. Greater is he that is in me than the one who is in the world. And sometimes we go through things in life. Sometimes we go things that create areas of our soul to get all tied up. And I, I think at some point we're going to have to revisit some of that, okay? But insecurities and fears and childhood wounds and traumas and different things that we walk through in life, you can be going through a financial difficulty and see no way out. And I will tell you that the enemy of our soul relies on these access points. We called them no trust zones. 
But I also understand in Scripture, and I think you would agree, in John 10, 10, Jesus said, I have came that you would have life. And life to the full. An abundant life. And friends, we can't live the John 10, 10 fulfillment when our souls are all tied up with trauma and life experiences that we're unwilling to deal with. Oh, you may achieve a level of operating in some freedom. But God doesn't want you just to operate in some freedom. He wants you to operate in the fullness of His freedom. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Lord. So 2 Corinthians 4, 8 kind of sums that whole thing up. You and I, we can be hard-pressed. Have you ever been in a place where you feel like it's just everything is just kind of coming in around you? And you, you know, one thing over here and one thing over there. And next thing you know, this person and that and all of this stuff. You're hard-pressed on every side. You're perplexed. You're persecuted. And then all of a sudden, boom, you get hit with a health issue and you're struck down. What in those moments are we going to trust? What are we going to magnify? Because I will tell you, the the enemy wants you and will always whisper in your ear to magnify the things that are causing you to be perplexed, the things that are causing you to be confused, the things that are crushing you in those moments. But when we say, no! I'm not going to listen to that voice anymore because my God has something different for me. In fact, He said that even despite all of these things that I'm going through, that I am not crushed, that I'm not in despair, that I'm not abandoned, and I am not destroyed. Amen? Matthew 10 and 28, it says, Do not fear our enemy. This is kind of just a summary of it. The enemy is a bully to your soul, your mind, your your will, and your emotions. He wants to bully you, and he will do that as long as we will let him. But it goes on to say, fear God, a healthy fear of God. Trust the Lord who holds your entire life in his hands. God's rod and staff, right? His authority, his word, give me everything that I need to navigate this life and defeat the voice of that enemy that's always waiting to speak. You remember when we started to look at verse 5. Remember the table that was set, right? God has prepared a table for us. It's a table for two. It's for you and Him. And the truth is, is whether you are in conflict or trauma or betrayal or the bitterness of life or the things that we mentioned before, Or maybe you're just in the midst of some bad choices or mistakes that you made. The invitation for you to sit with him at that table is always available. And I think sometimes we think that's going to be tucked away in some corner somewhere. But we also saw in that moment that he sets that table right in the presence of all the issues of my life. Doesn't that comfort you? You mean I don't have to get everything just right to come to God? No, you don't. In fact, that's why we come to God, to get some things right in our lives. He helps us with that. And it's important for us as believers to speak life and truth over people. I have watched people absolutely speak death, not even realizing it. They're cursing the people that they say they love, pointing out all their flaws, pointing out all their wrongs. Friends, turn it around and look at the plank in your own eye. Jesus, I think, said something about that. Love covers over a multitude of sin. Amen. Our shepherd anoints us with the oil of heaven. We saw and had the revelation that he removes those death ashes from our life, right? And as he does that, he, he, he calls us his own. And he, he anoints us with that oil and washes it away. My past, my present, my future. How great is the love of our Father, amen? It fills me to a place where I overflow and I want to share it with the world around me. 
And the last thing that we looked at over the last two weeks was the goodness of God, the beauty of God. And we understand that we experience this beauty of God in our lives through the kindness that He extends to you and I. The blessing that He wants to pour out on our lives. This is part of the fruit of being born again by the Spirit of God. Because after all, friends, we are new creations in Christ. Hallelujah! We can rejoice in knowing that I no longer am defined by who I was. I am defined by whose I am. Hallelujah. And I know all of us can say amen to that, friends. And you need to understand that God is pursuing you and I am pursuing Him. So here we are. The last stanza of verse 6. And it says this, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. Can you do me a favor, Joe? My office, there is a notebook, black one that I, my journal thing. Can you go grab that? Thank you. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. As long as I have breath for all the days of my life, God will chase me down. And in response to that blessing, I'm going to pursue Him. Just like David did. David came to the end of all of this and he said, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The truth is, life may bring me a lot of different things. Thank you. I will tell you that life might bring you loss. You may experience some difficulties. You might even get bullied. But I will tell you that God will never leave you. And He will never forsake you. I've said that many times in this. To dwell means this. It's a word that speaks in the Hebrew of coming home again. It speaks about the house of the Lord. It speaks about returning to the Lord. The house that David is speaking about here is God's house. It's His presence, if you will. It's His palace. And forever simply means for eternity. Now, I don't know about you, friends, but there are some troubling things that take place in our world. And I, I see the same stuff. I hear the stuff that goes on But I'm coming to a place now in my life where I've realized that those things are not what I'm living for. This world is passing away. This is not my real home. You know, Kelly and I have had this discussion. We say, where's home? Because we've moved around a little bit, you know. I lived up in northern Illinois. I've lived in western Illinois. I've lived different places. We spent 18 years in Galesburg. Is that home? We spent the last seven years here. Is Canton home? And I've, I've said, well, where are we gonna, where are we gonna bury our, each other? <laughs> I know that's morbid, right? Where are we gonna, where are we gonna plant ourselves in the ground, right? And we're just like, we don't know. And it was like in those moments, because I asked the same questions to the Lord. And he just said, this isn't your home. You're just pilgrims. Sojourners. We're just passing through. We don't own nothing. 
And it was in those moments that I realized, and I read this last stanza, heaven is my home. The patriarchs knew it. They knew it. They said things like, this world is not my home. They said that I'm looking forward, right, to the city. The city that has foundations, whose architect and whose builder is God. And I will tell you, friends, sometimes I spend so much time trying to figure out or to make sense out of things. And I recently was having a conversation with somebody that I talked to to help process life sometimes. I hope you have somebody like that. And she said to me, Craig, I went through a very difficult thing in my own life. And I laid in my bed one night just asking God, what was wrong with me? What did I do wrong? I can't make sense of this. And she said, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, quit trying to make sense out of something that doesn't make sense. And it set her free. And you know what? Sometimes things just don't make sense. But yet, I can trust because this is not my home. My home is one day with my Savior and my Lord in eternity. I'm going to close with this. This psalm has been incredible. Incredible is this journey with the Lord Jesus. For me, April of 92 was a pretty important year. Gave my heart to the Lord. 32 years, I was 24 years old. My life changed forever. Tragedy struck my life with the loss of my close friend. He was gone. There was a community and there was a family grieving. We were all trying to make sense of this senseless accident. But it was in that moment that I was awakened with my eyes wide open. I had an opportunity for truth and truth came. God did not disappoint. He answered my questions. He answered my questions of why. He answered my questions of struggle and all the stuff that we go through in this life. And I I experienced something. It was in those moments and in that season of my life and since then, He's been imparting faith into my heart. It went far beyond what I could understand in my own intellect because the truth is, is that I had peace in the midst of heartache. I had healing and strength when I suffered. I had growth when I went through betrayal and adversity. And I had comfort when I hurt. I had clarity of mind in confusing times. And I had assurance when life got foggy. And I had elation when I watched the mountains that were in front of me move. Home. Home. Finally home. Crazy. I know it is a future home but yet I experience it in the now. The ever-presence, all-knowing creator of all things has placed his seal over our hearts. Know this. I am his and he is mine. You are his and he is yours. So good, so faithful. In the good, in the bad, in the mountain, in the valley, I believe. Why, you may ask? How could I not? How could I not? He is true and faithful. Let's stand to our feet this morning. I don't want to rush out. I've asked Jessica to, and Kevin to minister for a little while. 
I understand if you do need to exit, that's fine. But I want to give an opportunity for us to spend a few moments together at these altars just to pray, to seek the Lord. I'll be up here over here. If you have a special need, I'll be available to pray for you, anoint you with oil. But I want to encourage you to come and just let the Lord minister to you. Or maybe through this psalm, God spoke something to your heart and you just need to make a fresh commitment to him in a certain area of your life. So Jesus, I pray that you will unlock our hearts this morning to receive the fullness of what you have for us. It's in your presence, God, that we experience the fullness of your joy and the true freedom, Father God, that we desire. So I pray right now that you will gag the lying whispers of the enemy that are trying to speak to some. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will take over in this moment. So God, thank you for this beautiful song that you placed in the heart of your servant David. And thank you, Jesus, for allowing me the privilege of sharing this with your people. It's in Jesus' name. I want to encourage you to come to the altars this morning.